give a discount. Now let's see two scenarios. When there's estimate of standalone selling price for both products has not changed since the original contract. Okay, now let's see the two scenarios. I have two scenarios again. Scenario A modification. When they are agrees to increase the number of catfish to be delivered by 50 units, conflict modification price per unit is 1,250, so additional units would be considered a separate contract. Why? Because this does not have to do anything with the previous price. Okay? Now let's see the second one. Scenario A. Vendor agrees to increase the number of cartridges to be delivered by 50 units. Contract modification price per unit is 1,000, which is less than the current standard of price of 1,250. Vendor would have to determine whether the 1,000 reflects the standard of selling price based on the specific facts and circumstances of the transaction. Now, uh, what, would you, what would you think? Uh, what is the uh, solution for the first one and the second one? Let's see. If the 1,000 does not reflect the standard of selling price, account for additional cartridges as a modification of the original contract. Okay? If you say that it does not reflect the standard of selling price, but is it reflected? Let's see. Uh, the cartridges not yet provided are distinct from those provided before the modification. Are they distinct? Yeah, they are additional ones. Right? Okay. Uh, Entity would allocate the, hold on, since it's distinct, what do you need to do? Terminate the old one and make a new one, okay? Entity would allocate the remaining allocated transaction price. So the 11,500 from the original contract. This is the still not provided ones. How many did I provide? I forgot already, but uh, 40, right? And the 40 was already provided, the rest is not plus the 50,000 from the new contract to the remaining performance obligation, which is 60. What is going to happen then? That the resulting revenue recognition of 1,025 when the control of each cartridge is transferred subsequent to the modification, okay? So once again, what is going to have? What is going to happen? Terminate plus new, okay? Now let's see what is the next uh, possibility. If the 1,000 does not reflect the standalone selling price, for instance, due to saving from marketing efforts, okay, additional cartridge would be considered distinct and sold at their standalone selling price and therefore should be accounted for as a separate contract. This is going to be which one? The first scenario, when you actually made a price of 1,250. Okay. Now, well, how do you know if you are within the scope uh, of uh, IFRS 15? Yeah. No, it's not going to be difficult to do by us. I don't to do be difficult. What we are going to check if under certain circumstances, do you have a history to sell like that, okay? If you, once again, the auditor is going to check the following. If you are stating that this is your standalone selling price, what do we want as an evidence? Show me transactions in the history. <coughs> what was more or less under the same situation, and you use that price. Okay, if you can't show that, what are we going to say? Our heart is bleeding, but you need to, you know, readjust. Okay? Now, I know that it's already very late. I mean, you all look like a bit dizzy. Uh, but I will do this one, okay? Because this is something that I really need to, uh, really need to deal with. Let me check how many slides is that in order to read three more, okay? Three more. And then you can have a coffee. I know. When first I read IFRS 15, to be honest, I felt dizzy. After the first page. Uh, and the reason for that, because, you know what I didn't understand? What's the difference? And then, when you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you see that this is a mean standard. 
And the reason for that because it looks everything is the same, but there are very small differences. And those are the hardest to catch, like the standalone rights. Okay? Now let's go to the criteria to be within the scope of higher policy. Now, what do you need to have in order to uh, what do you need to have in order to be under IFRS 50? Contract. Now, what do you? When are we saying that you have a contract? The parties to the contract have <coughs> their contract and are committed to perform their obligations. Okay. So, in order to when do we say that a contract exists? First of all, there is an approval, <laughs> right? Secondly, we not just sign. We actually are willing to fulfill. Okay, hold on for a second. Uh, in our audit uh, approach, we don't only see if you are willing to do it, but we also check if you are able to do it. Right? So those contracts which are existing legally, but it's obvious that you are not going to be able to do it, are not going to be treated as contracts. Okay? They are not going to be treated.
But in order to have a contract, you need to have specific things, what you need to do. I mean, to build a building sometimes is a contract. No, it's not a contract. It's a promise only. But it's not a contract. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can. Yes, you are right. So is this a contract? Hold on, hold on. You have actually a contract with several performance obligations. What is your first performance obligation? Yes. To design. Do you have that contract from the beginning? Yes. Do you have a contract? Yes. yes. And then the next time when you are going to progress? Uh -huh. And actually at the end of the day to have several contracts after each other, or you have one contract and several performance obligation, it will be, the, at the end of the day, it will get to the same result. So it doesn't, but your question was actually very relevant. Because, do you have a contract? Yes. And will you have a new contract? Yes, after you are done with the first one. Yeah. But they are going to call it performance obligations. Okay? Yeah? As a whole. Okay. Okay. Uh, without actually answering your question, and I'm repeating the question because maybe at the back they didn't hear. So they have a building company which has several activities. So you do the electricity, you do the boat, everything, right? Okay. And you're asking me if you have several performance obligations. Yes, you do. Do can you uh, account for them each separately? You don't just. You, you not just can, you must. And you must decide of each performance obligation one by one. If and it's price also Oh yes, and this is going to be step two, three, four, and five. We are at one now. Okay? Uh, IS 11, you mean? No, 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 he's asking the current rule. Yeah, the current rule. Current rule is unclear. In the current rule, we do, they did not actually uh, provide you how to separate the contracts and bundle them. Currently in IES 11, they are saying that if all the work is basically with one building, and they ordered it because they are strictly after each other and they generate one building, then it's going to be one contract. You are not going to separate them only under very specific circumstances. But, and that's again, I told you, this standard is being. Because only the slide changes, like this one. That, that was one contract, that is going to be 125 maybe, but we are not going to call them contracts, we are going to call them performance obligations, okay? Now, let, let me go over here, okay, because people are kind of like starting to call them. Uh, all right, the entity can identify the payment terms for the goods and services to be transferred. That's also very important. Contract also needs clear payment terms. That's obvious, right? Okay, the contract has a commercial substance. Hold on for a second. Tell me a contract which does not have a commercial substance. Very good. Love. Charity, right? Sometimes you give charity something for a nominal amount, right? Typical example, you give a building to a charity, which is, of, I'm not, not give it, but rent it out for $100 a year. Why would you do that? Just for taxation purposes, to have a piece of paper, right? Is it going to be under IFRS 15? No. How are you going to account it? Well, $100, <coughs> go ahead, do whatever you want. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> but uh, still, I mean, of course you're going to put it too. Where are you going to put this? Donation, well, actually, donation expense is going to be the depreciation of the building. And maybe you offset this 100 against the 
depreciation, but there is no rules for this, okay? Now, and collection of the payment is probable, but please write next to it because this is misleading. Collection is, uh, of the payment is probable when? At the beginning, right? Because later it may, you know, go away, this probability, and then it's going to be an impairment. Okay. Uh, all of them I must meet. If you don't have one of them, the contract is not existing, and that's very easy for an accountant if the contract is not existing, because what you do? You just lay back, relax, and wait until it meets, and everything what you received is going to be a liability. Correct. Okay? Now, let's go to the next one. If the transaction does not meet the definition of the contract and yet consideration is received, like I told you, it's going to be a liability. And when are you going to record this as a revenue? Because can it happen that you receive money and at the end of the day you did not have a contract after all? It's very rare, but it may happen. The standard is telling you that you are going to uh, record it as a, as a revenue when you have no remaining obligation to pay for anything and it's non-refundable or the contract has been terminated and the consideration received from the customer is non-refundable. Okay, so that's pretty obvious. I mean, logically, you would have done the same, right? <laughs> you would have done the same. Okay, if either of these events occur, revenue is recorded. Go over here. What is the difference between step one, I mean, between the current rules and the new standard regarding step one? Look, contract defined as an agreement, written, oral, or implied between two or more parties that creates enforceable rights and obligations. The requirements of IFRS 15 apply to each contract that has been agreed upon with a customer and meets specified criteria, okay? Uh, contracts must be combined when, when specified criteria are met, and IFRS 15 specifies how to account for the contract modifications. Okay, now let's see what is the changes. Honestly, these things I, are my own opinion. So there are <coughs> some other changes, uh, but these are the changes that I find the most uh, important. First one. Having an oral or implied agreement. It's something what some of the countries cannot digest. If you go to Europe, how do you recognize an accountant immediately? Well, if you say something, what is going to be the question? Do you have a business document on that? Right? Even if you are saying good morning. Okay. Uh, also, unlike the current IFRS, IFRS 15 specified how to account for the transaction with customers that do not meet the specified criteria for a contract. Okay, come on. Currently we done the same. What did we do with it? If we didn't have a contract and we received something, what did we do with it? We put it to liability. It's just now written down, black and white. Okay? Now let's see what else is here. IFRS 15 provides more explicit requirements on when to combine contracts and how to account for the modifications. Okay, modifications, once again, because that's important. If the modification is distinct, you terminate a new contract. Usually the new contract will have a blended price, right? It's going to have a blended price. So uh, let's just quickly summarize this because to be honest, out of the last 90 minutes, that's the most important and all the information I gave you. Nah, a bit more than that, but um, pretty much that's it. So if you have a modification, right, it's two types. Modification type number one, if it's this thing. Okay, then what you are going to do is terminate and you but keep revenue I mean the previous revenue untouched as is if it's not distinct what did we do? the cumulative catch up 
right? Without the cumulative ketchup. Uh, now, strictly, very strictly, from this side of the table, right? I usually tell my university students when I'm saying something which is not 100% correct. That's strictly from the other side of the table. What is going to be distinct and what is going to be not distinct? Usually things which are provided in a point of time. They are usually distinct. Not all the time, but mostly. Look, if I keep providing you services, each and every one, the distinct product, right? Then they are going to be distinct. I mean, I cannot imagine anything else. What is usually not distinct? At the same time. Not, what is the construction contract, for instance? Currently. When you are providing it, but you kind of modify it, change it. Okay? Good. Now, okay, it's been two hours now almost. Are you tired or you want to go on for step two? We can go on, good, good. He said it, it was him. <laughs> Thank you. 